Good afternoon and welcome back to CS240. This is Introduction to Computer Systems. And we are beginning our journey on Act 2. So uh, if you haven't grabbed a handout, um, they're over here. I tried to get most of you. I think I got all of you guys. Awesome. So I want to begin our journey through higher level abstractions as we move through the system. So what you already know right now is you already know how systems work. And now I think it would be really valuable to understand higher level abstractions around these systems. And specifically, we're going to look at how we do virtualization. And to begin that, I want to chat about what we know about an operating system so far. Because operating systems are really, really, really freaking amazing. Like what you may not actually realize is that the operating system has done some spectacular things and is really a great illusionist, is how I think of the operating system. It's kind of a magician. And what the operating system does is the operating system provides us, as a process, as a programmer on an operating system, it provides us, um, it appears, it provides us the appearance that we have an, in, an unlimited CPU access. So it looks like we have completely unlimited access to our CPU. It doesn't look like we're actually having these timer interrupts where multiple things are running at the same time. From the point of view of the process, we think we have exclusive unlimited access to the CPU. We don't worry about the fact that our code might be interrupted in between. This is something that's amazing. The operating system just handles that for us, and you know how it handles it. And we appear again to have unlimited memory. So through this idea of a page table, we appear like we have absolutely unlimited memory and an unlimited address space. If the system only has four gigs, we can allocate more than four gigs. We don't have to care about where the memory is stored or anything about it. And you implemented a memory manager through malloc. So we already have all these great abstractions. We already have things that we look like we can do anything we want on our system. Is there even a reason we need to do more? Is there a need for more abstractions? And the answer is, unfortunately for us, yes. Right now, we have, we're just looking at our current system. We have many different systems in the world. So there's lots and lots of different systems in the world, and we'd like to develop for all of them, or as many of them as possible, on our own devices. So in fact, in the past 10 years, virtualization has literally changed computer science. And our industry is so much better and so much easier to be a developer now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. So if we think about what virtualization um, does, like why do we need it? Well, if we just think about things that the operating system can do now, is if any of you have ever played old school um, games on a modern system, you probably use some sort of emulator. So I'm guessing most of you have never had like an SNES or one of those old school gaming machines, consoles. But many of you may have actually used an emulator to actually run the hardware that runs the Super Nintendo or any other old gaming console on your actual PC itself. This is a form of virtualization. We are taking a set of hardware that performed operations on a particular programming, um, on a particular assembly code, and you're now running it on a different set of processor with a different amount of RAM, with different timings than the actual console itself. You're virtualizing games. This is done all the time. You can also virtualize entire operating systems. So if you've ever used uh, virtual machines on your operating system like um, VMBox, or um, any of the other tools to use virtualization on your operating system, you can virtualize an entire other operating system. WSL does some of that through 
use it allowing to run Linux inside of Windows. You run an entirely different operating system within another operating system. And they know all of you guys, if you've taken 124, 125, has done, have done virtualization of Android. That you had to use Android Studio to actually virtualize the fact that you don't even have a phone inside your computer, but you're virtualizing the hardware that exists in a phone, and as you launch different phones, you can virtualize different phone interfaces. So you can pretend like you're on a five-year-old device that doesn't have much, um, a five-year-old device that doesn't have much power, has a slower processor and limited RAM, or you can pretend like you have the brand new Pixel 6 that hasn't even been released yet. Or the latest Samsung Galaxy S27 or whatever they're up to. So all of this is virtualization. It makes it possible for us to run these devices on a different set of hardware than the code was intended to be ran on. And this is super, super, super powerful. Because now we don't actually have to get these physical devices to program on these devices or to run code that's designed for these devices. And this is what virtualization is all about. So the big idea is the goal of virtualization, the entire goal of all of the virtualization we're talking about, the big idea is the goal of virtualization is to map a virtual machine map a virtual machine onto a host machine. The big idea is we want to map a virtual machine onto a host machine. And what this map interface means is that we want to think about some state that exists in the system that we'll refer to S sub X. And we want to make sure that we can represent whatever that state is on our host system. So if we know that that game or that variable or that whatever has some state inside the actual system. So if we think about an old school um, like Super Nintendo system or a Linux computer, and we know the state that that Super Nintendo or Linux computer is in, we need to make sure that we can have an equivalent representation of that state on some host machine. And that means that every time we transition from state one to state two, we have to figure out how that transition works on our host machine. So what we have to do is a machine, we have to first define exactly what a machine is. Because this terminology is kind of an older terminology that's used throughout computer science. So in the beginning of computer science, and as you look at kind of the deep, low-level system stuff, we actually define a machine not to be some physical hardware device. A machine in the context of virtualization is literally any entity that has an interface. So a machine in the context of virtualization is any entity that has an interface. So obviously, a computer has a lot of interfaces. But there's a lot of different types of interfaces that we interact with. We can talk about the API of a server being an interface. We can virtualize an entire web service that we're making. So anything that has an interface is defined as a machine. And then we talk about three different types of virtualization. And you have used, I think, all three of these types in your life already, without even realizing it. The first is a language-level virtualization. So language level virtual machine, virtualization, we've got to say, what is the interface? So the interface is the actual API to a machine. So the interface, when you do language level virtualization, is an API. So I think this is the one that sort of doesn't seem like virtualization to a lot of people. Because you have already, 
I'm guessing that the very first programming you did at University of Illinois, what language was it in? Java. What do you have to use to run that Java code? JVM. What does the JVM stand for? Java Virtual Machine. So from the first program you wrote at the University of Illinois, you were already using virtualization. So Java has this very interesting design choice where what Java did is Java takes your Java code and compiles it to bytecode, which is an intermediate language. And then that bytecode is then ran through a virtual machine to actually interact with the system, the host. So the virtual machine here is a language level virtualization. You're writing against the Java API, which the Java API, basically the bulk of what Java does is it creates virtual machines for every system out there so that the same code can actually run on multiple different pieces of hardware and they ensure all of those state transitions are always correct. So the JVM is a language level virtualization. It's virtualizing your code on different systems to different host environments. It's kind of the simplest level of virtualization. It's the virtualization that's been around the longest. So that's your JVM. Process virtualization is a little bit higher up. So the interface to the process level virtualization is your operating system. So how do you interact with the operating system? Specifically, the application binary interface, or the ABI, is what we'd call it. So when we interface with the operating system at a binary level, we call this process level virtualization. So one example of process um, level virtualization is there, there's a lot of things that kind of span this space. Um, in right now on a Mac, if you have an M1 chip, you probably had to install this program called Rosetta 2. Do any of you guys know what I'm talking about, those who have an M1 chip? So on an Apple machine, there's a lot of programs that exist on an Apple machine that are written in x86. They're compiled against an Intel processor, because that's what Macs have used for like 15 years. So there's a ton of code out there compiled against x86. But we need to interface with the newest level of the operating system and actually interface with the new ARM chips, the M1 chips. So how do we translate the interface between one binary interface to an operating system through all the x86 calls into a separate binary interface? So they're both interacting with the operating system, but they're doing the interactions through different ways. So this is one level. The other interface um, that exists with the operating system is going to be Docker. And we're going to talk a ton about Docker in this semester. So containers and Docker. And then the final thing is system level virtualization. So this interface here is the hardware. So you have entire things called hypervisors that actually interface with the entire hardware. So if you've heard of VMware, that is an example of system level virtualization. You're virtualizing the entire system. And what you get at the other side of it is you get an entire set of hardware that looks like you're exclusively on your own private hardware. So this is huge. This is system level virtualization. So any questions on kind of the different categories of virtualization? The goal of all of these is we are running code that is not directly ran on our physical system as it is. We have an interface that it sits between the actual physical host computer that we're on and the actual um, code that we're running. So we're virtualizing some aspect of running this code, whether that's at the API level, at the operating system level, 
or at the hardware level. And there's different levels of virtualization, and this allows our code to be so much more portable. If there's none, I just want to go through some really fast examples of language level virtualization. So first, let's think about language virtualization. So I want to know what, so I have a question for you. What's your favorite number? Five. So let's say our initial state is we have some error variable x equal to five. And I want to perform an operation on x equals 5. Specifically, I want to square it. I want to say x equals 5 squared. Now, of course, the square is an operation that most processors don't actually have implemented in hardware. So if we want to square 5, there may be, depending on the device that we're on, there may be different operations to do that. So one device might be uh, an x86 machine. So the actual transition that has to happen inside of our host machine, if we have some abstract language called math, that we wanted the transition between on our math machine from 5 to 5 squared, needs to do a square operation. On an x86 machine, we might copy the original value into a register, shift the values to the left by 2, and then add the original values. So what's the net effect of that? Yeah, multiplying by 5. So I have basically 1, 0, 1. I shift it left by 2, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then I add back this, so it becomes adding these together, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And this is my 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s, 16. 16 plus 8 is 24, plus 1 is 25. So at the end of this operation, on this machine, I get 25. This is a transition on a virtualized, in a virtualized environment on my host machine so I can compute the math in a way on that machine. I can also do this on my phone. But my phone may not have a complex shift left operation. It may only be able to shift left one time, once each time. That's OK. Because as long as we're able to virtualize it so that the end state after the transition is the same, we have a correct virtual machine. So here we take, we copy into R1 again. Then we shift left once to make it 1010. Shift left again to make it 10101. And then we add that to 101, the same add operation, so we know that gets to 25. And then maybe on your iPhone, this might be an Android phone, maybe on an iPhone, the add instruction is very, very, very fast, for example, possibly. I'm not actually sure. But it may say, I want to avoid doing shift operations. I just want to do addition. So in that machine, on that host system, it may simply add to itself five times. So 101 plus 101 plus 101 plus 101 plus 101. If we add all that together, it's going to be 11001 or 25. So the key idea here is it doesn't matter. Our math operation, the virtual operation that we're virtualizing, the operation we're virtualizing, is the square operation. There are many, many, many different ways of us to move from the state 1, which was 5, to the state 2, which was 25. There's a lot of ways of doing it. And what you do is you're building a virtual machine in a language level is you're providing the translation between how the state 1 moves to state 2 in code that actually can run on the host system. So that's the entire goal of virtualization, is thinking about how do we take a system that's usually not even defined in terms of machine anything, like math. How do we take a square operation and transform that square operation into something our host system can run?
So that's one language level virtualization. And the JVM does basically exactly this. Instead of taking math, it takes Java bytecode. Yeah. So yeah, is it, so this specific instance is effectively virtualizing multiplication by five, right? It just happens that her favorite number was five. So I did a square. I actually, I was originally gonna do times five. But the fact that she picked five made it very easy to do a square operation. So, but any, this is basically what would happen. This is an instantiation of the square operation on five, essentially. So obviously, your virtual, if you're building a virtual system, a virtual machine yourself, you're going to have a ton of logic on how do you actually map all these things to one another. Like, this gets crazy complicated on how you take this abstract idea and actually make it happen in a real system. So this stuff is building these and making them right is really, really, really hard. Like it's not easy to build these systems. And can you imagine debugging this? Like what if you just forgot to add one time? Like it's a mess debug. These are hard. So thinking about process level virtualization, one level up, so process level virtualization is going to be at the level that you want to perform some operation on some system. Um, so you might be at a level that you have something like WSL or Rosetta. So you've got WSL, for example, and WSL interfaces with the POSIX Linux API. You also have Win32, which is actually your host machine, and that interfaces with the, or we'll just call it Windows. And that interfaces with the Win32 API. So you've got these two different systems, and the virtualization needs to actually make it so that your WSL, as it interfaces with the POSIX Linux API, it looks like we're interfacing the POSIX Linux API, but ultimately, we're running on top of Windows. So what we have to do is, when it makes a call to the POSIX API, it needs to translate that call into a Win32 API call. So for example, initial state may be um, to run a Linux command, or sorry, run a file open or something. Transition is to transition the file open from a POSIX to a Win32 command. And the final state is it opened the file. So the state is we want to open the file. We need to figure out the transition steps to actually open the file on whatever host system I'm on. That's going to be different depending on exactly a whole bunch of different factors. So process level virtualization does it at the operating system level, as opposed to at the uh, language level. And then system level virtualization is the key thing that we're going to be talking about um, for the next few minutes. Because there's a lot of ability to do a lot of virtualization at a system level. So we're going to talk a lot more about process level virtualization when we talk about containers, because that's virtualizing an operating system. We're actually not going to spend too much time on system level virtualization, but system level virtualization has unlocked so much of what we can do as an industry. So system level virtualization is all about the idea of how do we create an entire system where it looks like we have an entire computer just to ourselves. And historically, there's been two different ways to do this. So one way is the type one hypervisor. So the type one hypervisor is the idea that we want to run on the hardware itself. Providing multiple VMs from a single physical machine. So 
So type 1 hypervisor runs on the hardware itself. So you're basically running something called a hypervisor. Now you're taking one really big, beefy computer, and you're saying this one computer is going to be split up into multiple virtual computers so that each virtual computer looks like it has the entire computer to itself. So when you're running on the hardware itself, this is very fast. But when you're running on the hardware itself, you have to require, you have to write your own drivers. So you have to decide how you're going to split things up. What this does is this replaces the operating system. No longer is the operating system the thing that's managing the hardware. Your hypervisor is now managing the hardware. So this is how most virtualization is done today. Most virtualization is ran on raw hardware itself. The alternative is a type 2 hypervisor. So a type 2 hypervisor um, runs on the operating system. So if we talk about like WSL, WSL runs like a type 2 hypervisor. And the fact that WSL actually runs on top of a host operating system. So the great thing about that is that it can rely on the OS drivers. So the operating system already has figured out how to manage all the hardware you have in your machine. So the fact the operating system has already figured this out is great. So you can rely on the fact the operating system already figured it out. So that makes it easy to use. It's super easy to use type 2 hypervisors. So Oracle has a program called VirtualBox that is a type 2 hypervisor that allows you to run an operating system inside an operating system. It is super dumb easy to set up VirtualBox. Like three clicks and you have an operating system running inside your operating system. It's super, super easy. But because you're living on top of a host operating system instead of running on the bare hardware, this is by far less efficient. So this is really the purpose of the past like 40 minutes has really been all about how do we get the terminology around the virtualization that's happening every day as we're building software. The idea that we have one environment we're building on, but we want to deploy on many different environments. And we may need to virtualize those environments at either a language level, a system level, or a process level so that our development tasks can be far, far easier. The thing, the key thing to know about all of this, though, is how has this changed our industry? So let's say you're going to found a new company. You're going to start a new company. And actually, this weekend um, was, so one of the, so like, uh, we'll talk about the exam in a second. So like, one thing that was awesome that happened last month was Reflections Projections. So RP was an event that was hosted by the student chapter of ACM, um, which is this organization. ACM is the organization of um, Association of Computer Machinery. And it's the kind of professional organization that most software engineers are part of. So they host this big event, kind of the flagship workshop that students host at the University of Illinois called Reflections Projections. So that happened a week or like a month ago. And a bunch of alumni come back. So if you're involved with ACM, that may be something in 10 years you come back to. This past weekend, besides being homecoming, which was so sad, um, there was a massive event going on with another big or student organization called Founders. And some of the founders of Founders 
were actually in town, and I got to chat with them. And many of them are just like you, but they've now gone on and created startups. And 10 years ago, if you wanted to create a startup, you actually had to go and buy a bunch of servers, figure out space to put those servers, plug those servers in, get the internet connection, figure out what software you want to install on all these servers, and then eventually $10,000 and five days later, you're finally able to launch something on the internet. Today, I'm guessing none of you have ever bought a physical ser server. I'm guessing none of you have probably ever even been in a server room. Oh, you have? Say what? Okay, so at your school, you still had, so this is like high school? Yeah, so your high school still had on-premise IT, it sounds like. Yeah, so there, there's 20 years ago, everywhere had this idea of on-premise IT. We have all the computing resources you need to run your entire school in one big room. It was probably white and stale and had a bunch of error handlers and it was really noisy. Yeah, it's noisy because you've got to keep all that hardware cool. You've got a bunch of fans, air conditioning units. You've got just a ton of stuff set up with the dedication of keeping this nice, pristine environment for these computers to be happy and run 24-7. So these are called server rooms, or now data centers. So they are really, really expensive. So I'd say in the 2000, you had these massive dedicated server rooms, and you probably see them, they're actually organized into racks. So you have basically these carts that then have these racks, and each rack is like a 1U server. So you sit all these machines in a rack. You probably saw these racks in your server room. Yeah, so I'm guessing if it's anything, if it's a professional server room, it's definitely going to be in these racks. They actually talk about how big the computers are. One U units are like two or three inches thick. Um, so some servers are like four U's. So they take up like four blocks inside the server racks. So you basically have the standardized measurement of how you can slide different machines in these racks. You can roll them around, set them up for networking. You had to do all of this yourself just to start up building a company. So if you want to found a new company tomorrow, what would you do? Yeah. Yeah. You might go to AWS. And you might then rent a piece of one box, right? You might rent some compute power and a database and a CDN and any other piece you need for your application. And how long would that take you? If you knew what you were doing, maybe an hour. If it was the first time doing it, I'm guessing you can do it in less than a day. So what used to cost $10,000 just to take an idea that you have and put it into action now costs less than $100. So this is transformative. Because we can virtualize hardware, we can segment a single box into lots and lots of different customers. Because we can virtualize operating systems, we can spin up a container that has a database in it on one of these virtualized machines so that you can have a database running on a machine that you only rent the piece of it that you need so you don't have to buy the entire machine. And because there's isolation and abstraction here, this can all be done in a data center that you never have to see. So now, while I used to have like server boxes that it sat around, in a building. Now I just write a check, or well, Amazon charges my credit card, a few hundred dollars every month for all of the resources I'm using from AWS to host all the different projects I'm hosting. So this is huge. This has changed our industry for the better, to the point that you can actually write cloud-scale applications 
without leaving your laptop. And this absolutely wasn't possible 20 years ago. So how do we leverage all of that power? And if you are interested in kind of the startup community, that is something that I think University of Illinois, like 10 years ago, we were terrible at thinking around startups and being entrepreneurial. Today, I feel like more and more of the alumni that I know are at least going out there and trying something. So like this past weekend, I talked to about five different people who have founded startups all the way from being in the housing space to um, being in the kind of small business application space. So there's lots and lots of different ideas and lots of support you can get. Yeah. So virtualization technology was really primitive 20 years ago. So I think AWS started in like 2004, five, six time period. So there were a few people, like there were hackers probably doing some virtualization and be like, cool, look, I got two containers running on one computer. Um, but no one kind of put it all together and then provided the kind of the usability so that you can just log onto a website and say, hey, I want to spin up this box, here's an IP address. So I would say that I really, like, I didn't touch my first virtual machine until probably like 2009-ish. And I've always been like pretty, like, into building stuff. So these just weren't mainstream, even if the technology might have existed. Any other questions? So our industry has changed, and for the better. But before we kind of flip over the page, I want to chat about the midterm exams. So you guys overall did a fantastic job on the first 12 questions, I think the overall average for the first 12 questions was above 90%, which was fantastic. But I want to chat about the last question and take a look at the code. So um, first, I wanted to know, um, I want to chat with you guys on how this experience was. How many, how many of you was this your first CBTF exam? Have you never taken a CBTF before? How was it? <laughs> okay, so the pencils are shortest pencils ever. That's interesting. I feel like that's a new thing. <laughs> Bring your pen. Awesome. How was it? First time as well. Oh yeah, polarized. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to like look at it straight on or it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's how the CBTF wants us to set up the exams now. So, um, but I, it, I can bring the timer back. I can not follow their instructions if you prefer the timer. No, I mean, if, if you don't like it, I'm happy to bring it back. Because, yeah, if that's easier to have that timer right there to know how you're doing. Because, yeah, I think there might just, like, be one clock. And I think first time in CBTF as well, Aaron? Oof. Sounds pretty cringe. That is a problem I can't fix, unfortunately. Uh, lots of hand sanitizer, hopefully. Um, so the second question, do you feel like the exam was as advertised? I didn't trick you or anything. Yes, no, maybe. Do we like the format of kind of the practice exams? Is this good, bad? Good? Do you feel like you knew, at least for the first part of the exam, you knew exactly what to expect? Should be pretty fair. Um, and then the programming question. So thoughts on the programming question? Yeah.
Not zero points. Um, she got a little bit of points to her compiling. And even if you got the zero points altogether, um, I ended up, I did give you everyone the one point if they wrote any code at all. So you, you didn't get quite zero, but you got close to zero, you're right. Um, but, so, and then, um, so it is definitely frustrating to have one small bug that can cost a lot of points. Um, I tried to kind of, when I was thinking about it, it's like, okay, what's the MP that you've most recently done? And what is code that we have shown off in class, the exact code you need to add? So if you knew the, either all the lecture code or the MP code, you should be set up. So problem to refresh your memory is, um, so if we go to, oops. Um, so if I do git pull, git stash, git pull, and get the code for 13. So I have for you the exact exam question, which you also have on Prairie Learn. Um, so you can read the readme of the actual question itself. And I have the code, the server.c code. So I wanted to at least kind of go through this and have you think through the solution. So basically, we had a game that was um, similar to the MechMania contest at Reflections Projections, at least in the sense of the infrastructure, where you basically have many player threads that each have a number, that each have an action that they may generate. So you have lots of different players that are generating actions. Those actions then have to be performed on a single server. So you have many player threads, a single server thread. And we needed to synchronize all of these different player threads so that when we launch like a million of them, they could all still work with that single server. So kind of a classic synchronization problem. And the way we communicate between the server and the player was a queue. And this queue, like every queue, has a bounded capacity. So we only had one shared variable, and that was a queue. So when we have a shared variable that's accessed by multiple different threads, what do we have to do? Yeah, we have to block multiple threads from accessing it. By creating a lock. By creating a lock, yeah. So kind of the first thing I'd think about is, OK, let's do a. Um, thread new text t lock. Some of you guys made it a pointer. Some of you guys made it just a lock itself. And then you had the documentation for all of this. So I just called it lock. And then in the top of main, I can do p thread new text init and init my lock. So I was able to initialize my lock instead of main, and then I need to lock by critical section. What is the only shared variable? Q. So everywhere I access the Q, I need to make sure it's in my lock. So player get action, does this access the Q? No. Action equals null, does this access the Q? Nope. Q and Q, does that access the Q? Yes. So p thread new text lock, sending my lock in, and as soon as I finish accessing the queue, I need to unlock. And then um, up here, let's see the same idea. Um, inside my while one loop, action queue, um, DQ, does that access the queue? Yes. All right, action equals null, does this access the queue? No. And game apply, does this access the queue? No. So the only line that accesses the queue is the day queue operation. So pthread mutex lock, pthread mutex unlock. So what we've done here is we've now protected the critical section. That at this point, you have successfully prevented multiple threads from accessing the queue at the same time. And what I can do is I could even 
um, compile this. So gcc server.c and um, support.c minus lp thread minus o server. Oops, I'm not, sorry, I'm not actually in Linux. CD13, GCC, server.c, support.c, minus, uh, minus LP thread, server. Awesome. So I run the server, and I see, oh, okay, everything, I don't get any error about multiple threads accessing things, but I get that a queue exceeded the capacity. So I got this nice error message, and when the queue exceeded the capacity, what's the last thing I need to do to complete this program? Matt? Yeah, I've got to do a con uh, condition variable, but specifically, what do I need to protect it on? Yeah, so I've got to make sure that my queue is not going over capacity. So here I'm going to say, when I'm going to day queue, if I day queue, what's the condition that has to always be true? Before I day queue, I must have. Yeah. So the condition that cannot be true is while the queue size of my queue is equal, sorry, not queue size, queue length. Uh, let me just look at the API. Um, Q size, it is size, size and capacity. Well, the Q size is equal to zero. I cannot, I don't want to continue. So while the Q size is equal to zero, I need to be stuck there. This is just like the wallet resource that you did in MP4. So to get my stuck, self stuck to P thread condition wait, Give it the conditional variable, give it the lock. Since I need a conditional variable, I need to go ahead and do p thread condition t condition. And then down in main, I'm going to do p thread condition init. Condition my conditional variable. Okay, so I have protected the um, server. By saying, while the queue size is zero, I need to just hang out and sleep. The only other thing I should protect is I should protect the other side of the queue. And in doing that, what is the condition that I should never in queue? What should I avoid? I should never run the in queue line if the queue is. Yeah, if the capacity is the same as size, we should not continue. So while. Q capacity of the Q is equal to Q size of the Q. Then I need to P thread condition wait. Oh, yep, thanks. So while both of these, while that condition is true, I need to pee for condition wait. So if I just condition wait, I'm going to sleep forever. How do I wake up a condition? Yeah, p thread condition signal or broadcast. Yep, p thread condition broadcast on the conditional variable. So anytime I change the state of the queue, I'm going to go ahead and pthread condition broadcast. So basically, inside the while loop, I say I'm going to sleep until somebody tells me to wake up. When I wake up, I'm going to check if my condition is true or not. And if it is true, I can exit that with a while trap and then continue on to the queue line. So now, having made these changes, I can compile and run the server. Server takes a few seconds to run. And we see player one finished all actions, player two finished all actions, game completed. 
So we added the same code that we saw in lecture, or the same code you saw in MP4, to basically capture the fact that you need to protect the capacity of the queue. So the solution right now also here gives you extra credit because I made the critical sections as small as possible. I didn't protect no lines of code that was in the original code that didn't need to be in the critical section were in the critical section. So, yeah. So how does the server exit? It doesn't. So I wanted to keep this code as simple as possible. So once the two clients exit, I just attach the server and say, eh, we're good. So in reality, like maybe you should actually put a special signal or a special thing in the queue to say the server's done or something. There's different approaches you can use, but I wanted to keep this code as simple as possible. I didn't want to add a bunch of extra stuff that, a bunch of logic that wasn't required. So the second part was I, so to make this work robustly, I had to use broadcast. But what if I wanted to make this work without needing to use broadcast? Yeah. Oh, I can use multiple conditional variables. What conditional variables would you want to use? Okay, and why would you want to use full and empty? Awesome. Yeah, so the idea here is the, when you add something to the queue, the only people who care about when you add something to the queue is somebody who's waiting on the empty queue, right? And if you're removing something from the queue, the only people that care about the fact you're removing something from the queue is the person waiting on the full queue, right? So to get the full amount of extra credit, and this is why it was extra credit, you would have to have like a condition on your server and condition on the client or the player. So the condition on the server says, I'm in my server, I'm gonna wait on the server conditional variable, and I'm going to signal the server in my client code. So in my client, I'm going to signal, and now I don't need to broadcast, I just need to signal, and say, hey server, you should wake up and see if you can continue now. And on the other side, the client is going to have the client variable waiting on, and I'm going to broadcast, or sorry, not broadcast, but now I only need to wake up a single client. I can ping a client and say, hey, one client wake up because I've removed something from the queue, now you can add something to it. Sorry? Oh, yep, sorry. Thanks, yes. So often you think of this in a client server model, so I clearly am just pre-programmed for the pattern. But yeah, condition player, because we call it a player. The last thing I need to do is I need to make sure to initialize both of them. So we have the condition player and the condition server. So having fixed, I think, all three of these, we will see if I get any compilers. I don't. And now I run this, and this code still works. And in fact, it should work a little bit faster. It's now a little more efficient because I'm not waking up extra things. When I broadcast, I say, hey, wake up everything. So that solution would get um, all of the extra credit points. And Several of you actually got this, which is awesome. So you got full credit just for having the mutex and additional variables. Um, you got extra credit for the smallest possible critical section where you really looked at each line of code and decided if it accessed the queue or not. That gave you some extra credit. You got all the extra credit if you were able to kind of take the time and realize, hey, I could have two conditional variables that makes the program the most efficient it can be given this setup. 
So I tried to make this as sort of related to the MP as possible. And if you got, um, if your code design just basically deadlocked because of one small thing, um, I, I went through all of your codes. And if you got really close, um, I wrote to you and sort of talked to you about kind of what you did wrong and um, was able to give you some amount of partial credit. Um, if your solution didn't have this core setup, um, you got the small amount of extra credit for having some code set up. So this was the MP, uh, or this was the programming question on the exam. So any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see. Where did I? Um, the only place where you, whoops, on kind of a hint, um, you need to add code. Yeah. I, I think it could have been slightly more clear. I don't think I saw anyone who tried to not use globals. Um, but yeah, you do. You definitely probably need a global. That'd be hard to do without a global. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? So this kind of idea of synchronization of having multiple threads working together is really core to a lot of how you're doing program, how programming works in the modern era. So the async a wait stuff is that you're going to see in, a, in Python and JavaScript and other high level programming languages rely on this idea of conditional variables and waiting for a thing to happen before another thing occurs. Um, honestly, something that didn't get full credit is some people actually just threw a while one sleep or inside of there instead of having conditional variable. So it actually prevented the queue from overflowing and underflowing. It kind of busy waited, which defeated part of the problem, which didn't get full credit. But it did actually protect the synchronization and play the game. It just did so really inefficiently. So if you get, sort of had a while loop and you slept inside the while loop, um, it's sort of a a hack way of doing conditional variable, definitely not the correct way, but it was another way to kind of be like, okay, I know the tools I can do to accomplish the problem. Because often as being a software engineer, part of the skills that you're gonna get is sometimes you gotta be a little scrappy. You gotta be like, okay, how do I solve this problem? What tools do I have to, to make sure I can get the server running? Because when it's in a, if it's four hours before your big launch and something breaks, you've gotta figure out how to fix it. So I think these are kind of really awesome skills to kind of get started with. Any questions? So my goal is that I'm going to be, I've worked with grades um, so far. I've done like three different runs of MP1, really refining kind of the auto grader, making sure everything's exactly um, working the same. I'm now working on MP2. There's a few last remaining issues I've heard about from a couple of you on MP2 grades being slightly different between the GitHub and my run, even though I'm using the same GitHub um, containers, the same Docker containers, the same everything that GitHub's using. Um, so I wanna make sure that I can mimic the environment that GitHub runs in so that you can, um, that even if your code isn't perfect, I wanna try and make sure that we can mimic um, the scores you're getting on GitHub my goal is to, get, I feel like I'm really close to kind of having all of that perfect for everyone, for all the issues I know about. Um, and then I'm gonna get three, four, and five up as well with the goal to have all of the grades back to you um, by Thursday. And then on Thursday, we can chat about where's the course's average, the average grade, how are people doing, what's the distribution, so you can know exactly where you're standing in this course. And I can look at it and say, if this was in the semester, would there be a necessity to like have any curves or anything? So you'll have a good idea of exactly where you're standing and like what letter grade you're at right now. So that is gonna be our chat on Thursday. Cool. So in the last 15 minutes, I wanna get back and talk about cloud scale abstraction. So cloud scale abstractions are basically something that we're going to kind of touch on for the entire rest of the semester. And this involves a bunch of terminology you've probably heard about. 
So there's a bunch of buzzwords, essentially, that get thrown around that describe different levels of abstraction on top of the system. Because part of what Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure does is it manages some of the things that we used to have to manage in our server room. And one of the most important things for you as app developers and programmers and computer scientists to know is what level of tools should I let somebody else manage and what do I want to manage for myself? So when you get a, anything as a service, you're basically paying somebody else to manage some of the lower level things for you. So if you have infrastructure as a service, Infrastructure as a service is the idea that you are going to have the hardware managed by somebody else. You don't have to have the physical server room. Amazon's going to store the physical server room. So Amazon manages your hardware. And Amazon manages your virtualization. So I'm going to call the abstracted by the vendor. I'm going to make in blue. You can use dash lines if you don't have different colors or whatever you want. And then what you're going to do is you, then there's going to be a consumer managed unit of scale. So what is the thing that you scale a bunch of? What is the thing you create instances of when you're getting infrastructure as a service? When you get infrastructure as a service, you basically choose the operating system you want to make, you want to put on your machine. So when you start up an EC2 instance on AWS, you choose, do you want to run Ubuntu? Do you want to run OS X? Do you want to run Windows? How many OS Xs do you want to run? How many Ubuntus do you want to run? The unit of scale when you have infrastructure as a service is how many of what operating systems do you want? And then because you're managing the operating system, you get to decide everything else on top of that. You can decide what programs are running on the operating system. You, get a, you have a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility here. So all you do is choose the operating system. Amazon creates that operating system, gives you a box with a default install of that operating system on it when you're getting infrastructure as a service. So this is like EC2 is the Amazon product here. So maybe you don't ever want to manage an operating system. Maybe you don't want to log into an SSH terminal and use root and install software and do all that kind of stuff. Maybe you want to pay Amazon to do some of that work for you. So the second level of abstraction is the idea of containers as a service. So here, Amazon manages the hardware, the virtualization, and the operating system. And you provide a container file to Amazon. You provide what container do I want to run on that particular system. So Amazon now takes care of running an operating system that's going to just run a bunch of containers. So they're providing higher level abstraction and infrastructure as a service is going to be the cheapest. As you move up, you're generally going to get more expensive because notice there's more work Amazon or Microsoft or Google is doing for you. The third thing is platform as a service. So platform as a service is the idea that the hardware is managed for you, the virtualization managed for you, the operating system is managed for you, and the container is, uh, may or may not be managed for you. And you choose the actual... Um, and then basically you're going to choose... Um, they're going to decide basically what runtime you're going to use. And you're going to choose the actual application you're going to run on. So you're basically providing, you're basically choosing an executable that you want to run. So if you just want to say, I want a database, I want MongoDB, I want Redis, I want MySQL, this is a platform. You're saying, I want this particular runtime. And I want this database set up in this way. So this is running basically a database in the cloud. And what's great about it is Amazon's providing experts, engineers, who have set up those machines to run that database as efficiently as possible. Because they're setting it up 
so that you don't have to care about, oh, what's the best type of hardware to run a database on? What's the best kind of hard drives to use? All of those decisions, there's experts who are already making those decisions that have optimized your database to be as fast as possible. So if you just want to run a database, it's far more efficient to basically say, hey, Amazon, I want a database. They're going to provide you an interface to the database. You don't have to install it. You don't have to patch it. You don't have to do any of the stuff if you're running an operating system that has a database on top of it. So if you're getting an EC2 cloud and running a database on it, you've got to patch everything else underneath it. As a platform, as a service, you say, hey, I just want a database. Here's some money. Here's a database. Great. So anytime you want a particular platform that you're going to use, that is platform as a service. And there is tons and tons of these. There's thousands of different platforms you can choose to have as a service. And we're going to look at... Um, we're going to look at how you might use some of those in our next MP. And then um, above that, you have function of the service. So function of the service, same idea. You've abstracted away everything except for functions. Um, generally, I don't think about... So application and functions are kind of two of the same things. Um, I really wouldn't circle um, as an Amazon abstraction on the... Application, because functions are, these are kind of lambdas. Um, so the idea that you may, or, you may not have an entire application you want to run, you just want to run one function in that application. So that's going to be a single function. This is function as a service. And then the highest level of abstraction provided by cloud providers is, data, is software as a service. Where the only thing you provide is data. So this is anything like Google, Google Drive or Dropbox. You can purchase a bunch of storage from Dropbox. The only thing you provide to Dropbox is actual files. It manages the hardware. It manages the servers. It manages the stories, storage. It manages everything else except for the data that you're bringing to the software. So they provide software that has some functionality, and you bring the data to that software. So Salesforce, a big customer relationship manager. You bring the data about your customers, they provide everything else on the stack. So everything we think about building can be somewhere along the spectrum. We can say, hey, I want to start with an operating system, build up from there, and Amazon will give you an operating system. Amazon will also give you an entire instance of an existing application where all you have to bring is data. And this is a spectrum of the world that we live in. We have so many choices of how we want to design applications and so many things we want to build on. So in your goal as a software engineer is to figure out where do you, what pieces do you use to build your dream application? Do you want an entire operating system, or do you just want a database? Do you want to buy a platform, or do you want to buy infrastructure? And of course, you could always go one level left and just have all the hardware yourself. So that's basically the one thing, the self-hosted plan, the server room. Say very few people are doing the server room anymore. But you could certainly pay for nothing um, and manage the hardware yourself. But these are the different levels of abstraction. So kind of just same idea, not, not colored live. And we're going to refer back to this diagram a lot. So any questions on this diagram and kind of what we're seeing here? As you hear these acronyms, IAS, PAS, SAS, this is what they're talking about. What levels of abstraction does the vendor provide for you? What is Amazon or Google or DigitalOcean doing for you? And what are you scaling? And what's, what do you have to manage yourself? Yeah? So it's the thing you basically buy. So when you're actually purchasing infrastructure as a service, you choose the operating system. So it's the thing that you're saying, I want X of this. So the yeah, so in like an, an IIS, an infrastructure service, I basically go to Amazon and I say, hey, I want seven boxes running Ubuntu. And that's basically, basically whatever's in green is the order you're making to the service provider. So I order operating systems, I'm, doing, I'm running on infrastructure as a service. 
So software as a service, you are buying, you are saying, I want an entire application that does X. Applications that customers are at scale? Yeah, so data is basically the thing that I'm providing. Basically, I have a bunch of data, and I want to, like, if I have a mailing list, I might go to, like, MailChamp with my data, and I'm saying, here's my data. You provide a service with that data. So it's, what am I bringing to it? So I'm bringing, I want Ubuntu. I'm getting operating systems. I have data. I want to do things with data. I think it, the analogy certainly does break a little bit at a software as a service scale, just because there's so many different things software can do. But the idea is, like, what is the thing the consumer brings and the consumer scales on. What are you adding to as you're getting more of this product? If I'm getting more of my mailing list, I'm adding data. If I'm getting more of more operating systems, I'm getting infrastructure. So I want to just very briefly mention um, infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service is things like EC2 and Google Compute Engine. Um, so this is where you purchase a box, and when you purchase that box, it goes to a particular um, instance. So beyond that, um, why would you ever choose infrastructure as a service? You get complete control of everything on the OS. So sometimes you need complete, absolute control of absolutely everything on the operating system. So you can install whatever version, or whatever stuff you want. So if you just want to have a bare bones server, infrastructure as a service is great. But infrastructure as a service is also a huge negative in that way. That you have to decide how to best optimize a database. You have to decide how to optimize every single part of your system. So I, I actually love being at the low level. So I actually, most of my, well, most of my costs on Amazon is actually bandwidth. Um, but beyond bandwidth, um, my second greatest cost is for EC2 boxes. Like I have a lot of infrastructure as a service. Because I want to be able to manage how all of my individual boxes work. I'm often having lots of different programs running on all of the different boxes. So where we're going to, um, so I want to just introduce this, and then we'll leave, um, this will be our last slide. Containers, on the other hand, provide a snapshot of a system that can be deployed in an isolated environment, or provides an isolated snapshot, sorry provide an isolated shop snapshot of a system that can be deployed in an environment um, on heterogeneous systems. So what, if, so what if you don't want an entire hardware stack? What if you don't need an operating system? What if you just want to snapshot an operating system in a moment of time and take that snapshot and deploy that snapshot in different places? So you just want to get everything about the operating system, the exact moment your computer is on right now, Save this moment like a photo, and then start from that photo at a time in the future. And instead of managing the entire operating system, this is what Docker does. So what we're going to start with tomorrow on Thursday is we're going to start talking about Docker, which is a containerization service. And the best analogy of what Docker does is it takes an exact snapshot of your operating system and then carries that photo over to another environment and runs that snapshot just as though it was on a different computer. So Docker creates snapshots of a particular environment, including all the system's infrastructure, and then runs that environment on a different machine on demand based on that snapshot. So Docker is a really, really powerful tool, and we'll talk about Docker and how to use Docker on Thursday. You have extra credit to explore Docker a little bit yourself as part of MP6. So there's this nice analogy for you to build a Docker file yourself. I'm going to talk about that extra credit and how um, you actually use it on Thursday. And then your MP this week 
is going to be about build, using other people's Docker containers to build something where you don't even have to think about the database yourself. So I'll be here after lecture if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a fantastic week, and I will see you guys back here on Thursday.